morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am your host, Scott Ramph. Uh, let me just adjust the volume just a little bit more just to kind of see about that. All right, so let me usher you guys into the weekend. It is December 11th. I taped this on December 10th, but I'm going to be talking about a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of vaccine news that are happening nationally, about some of the local news that's happening here in Missoula. I got dubbing stuff where I'm going to, uh, where I redub an old movie from way back when in the public domain and bring it to you. Uh, I also have pre-critics. So we'll get all that and more as we dive into Wake Up Missoula. Early Tuesday, the Food and Drug Administration says that by Thursday, um, they will be approving the uh, Pfizer vaccine for emergency use. And what that means is that they're going to be using this for people who, um, you know, first responders, health responders, uh, people who work in uh, uh, assisted living homes uh, where people are high risk. Um, also people who are high risk and who live in those kind of environments who uh, ha have a tendency to not uh, deal with COVID-19 so well. Each state will be um, in charge of rolling out the vaccine and distributing it. Uh, Missoula's City County Health Department reported earlier this week that it states that it will receive more than 9,000 doses of the vaccine throughout the state as it will trickle in uh, by December 15th. Uh, like emergency use permit, health workers, assisted living homes, and, and their staff are among those getting those vaccines outright. So far, the community will not see vaccines for months for major distribution. Um, there was also another story on NPR. I kind of glanced at it that they say they're going to have some difficulties with uh, distribution in America since in other countries the demand is so much higher and the, the United States uh, didn't put down the uh, I think the uh, $100 million to kind of expand on the doses. So, But so far, uh, the United States is guaranteed 100 million doses throughout. And most of these doses, how they're going to be doing it is they're going to be doing the first dose. 21 days later, roughly, they're going to do the second dose. So that's only going to cover about 50 uh, million Americans um, in the United States. So right now, U.S. Congress is looking to uh, figure out additional stimulus package, but so far what they've managed to do is uh, um, keep the government from shutting down for a week, so they uh, quickly came up with the money to continue the uh, session for another week for into, to prevent government shutdown. Uh, of course, last week, a $908 billion proposal from a group of bipartisan central lawmakers restarted talks for a new round of stimulus aid for the first time in weeks bef uh, between top congressional leaders, and White House officials, but they have been unable to reach an agreement. Uh, the key concern for Republicans in this one is the uh, shield for businesses during the pandemic, while uh, the Democrats want to uh, put most of this money towards uh, unemployment and uh, help those um, folks who have lost their jobs. So far, time has ran out time and time again, and uh, the CARES Act, uh, which was uh, slated to go as far uh, for um, airlines here in Missoula, it was supposed to end sometime in the end of October. Uh, some things are ending in, uh, most others ended in somewhat dis, um, November. Uh, there's some grants that are available for some organizations that are going to start wrapping up in the middle of December as well. So that's kind of what's happening with that. Um, there's not, uh, back when the uh, first uh, stimulus uh, package was uh, unveiled. A lot of people thought this would only last for about six months for a uh, as a necessity, but as we are seeing that uh, those changes are kind of um, uh, have to be done to move forward as well. Uh, this week, uh, if you uh, need to know what's happening in Missoula, the, uh, something else besides uh, COVID news is that the Garden City Ballet will be uh, putting on performances this weekend as well. And so they'll be live streaming on MCAT.org via Local Live. And Local Live is our live streaming channel that is uh, only available at MCAT.org. It is one of those few uh, uh, RTMP... <coughs> sites that allow you to uh, watch videos without it being uh, taken down by uh, YouTube, copyright, uh, Facebook. So we provide a lot of, uh, um, you know, like musical performances who uh, can't necessarily post it on, uh, online as successfully as they would be able to on local live. Hence Local Life. So Garden City Ballet will be hosting the Nutcracker, their annual show. And this year they're doing a little bit differently. 
Um, I don't want to say why because you probably already know, uh, COVID, uh, <laughs> but they're going to be doing that pretty much all day Saturday, Sunday. Um, you get to see kind of behind the scenes type stuff during that as well with some um, times in the middle to film. So that's kind of what's happening there. Uh, MCAT will be also live streaming another thing happening on Saturday night with uh, Corey Faye and the good God darn uh, to censor myself, uh, but you guys can enjoy that starting at 7.30 on MCAT's local live, but also uh, the Zootown Arts Community Center's YouTube and Facebook page. But without further ado, here is another uh, showing of the same promo I've been showing pretty much uh, for the last couple months of MCAT's new home inside the new library. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some movies. MCAT is Missoula's community media resource. NCAT offers equipment like camera rentals and training like instruction and distribution help like cable TV channels, starting your own YouTube channel, a short clip for Instagram or Facebook. NCAT helps people who want to make TV shows, social media clips, and podcasts. In our new home, in the Missoula Public Library, MCAT will be offering classes in camera use, getting the best sound and lighting quality, how to use a multi-camera studio with green screen and other special effects. In addition, we will be teaching video editing on popular platforms like iMovie, Final Cut Pro, and Adobe Premiere. For kiddos, we offer animation classes along with other multimedia activities for after school, during the weekend, and summer camps. MCAT has been serving the Missoula community for over 30 years with the material and the guidance to let your creative side blossom in audio-visual video. Be sure to visit us on the first floor of the new Missoula Public Library. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's time, let's time, yes, it, it is time for Pre-Critic. Pre-Critic is brought to you by absolutely nobody but myself because I wanted to somewhat sound funny. Uh, this is where I prejudge a movie whether it needs it or not. It's time for Pre-Critic kicking things off is the Black Book of Father Denise, D D D Dennis, I'll just call it Dennis. Uh, we welcome you into the dark world of the 1800s and uh, Europe, Lond you know, UK, mostly Europe. Um, as a woman navigates her life. Take a modern take on uh, literature as we dive back into the 1800s, assuming the traditions and modern takes and how the world should work and not have anything to do with historic accuracy. You get some Jane Austen themes going on. A woman who is strong, independent, mind you, pushes against social norms and figures out that being different can be good and rewarded somehow. Uh, they should make a Joan of Arc movie where she doesn't die at the end and then people will be like, is that's not how it happens. Like, well, this is how this movie happened. It's a movie. What are you going to do? Um, and then that's kind of what it's all about. The Black Book of Dennis or whatever. Up next, we got uh, a movie where they want to save money on CGI. It's called Arch Enemy. You want to save money on a superhero film? Well, this is what you got to do. You got to make your superhero uh, lose his powers, but without actually showing it. So it's the idea that this character is a crazy person, uh, thinking that they have superpowers, and so they kind of build a narrative around it. And you'd be like, hmm, maybe this person does have superpowers, but they don't have to spend too much money on CGI. Boom, you got this movie. Uh, it has actors in it, and a former superhero that is depowered, and he friends a kid. I see where this is going. Um, <laughs> uh, the boy doesn't believe him, obviously, but then as more and more things start to happen, he gets more and more convinced. I kind of hope this movie doesn't actually have superpowers or CGI. I think it's uh, just some older adult, adult who like uh, uh, takes the kid's kidney and just runs away and is like, maybe he wasn't super after all, or maybe he was. I don't know. I, I, it kind of seems like those kind of movies that's going to have one of those kind of wink at the audience endings. And here is another movie that seems to kind of remake the old story of Ip Man, or as many people remember as Yip Man. And he is the guy who trained Bruce Lee, just so you guys know, like, that's his claim to fame. Um, okay, this movie doesn't have much uh, Chinese national treasure uh, Donnie Yen in this movie, so you might as well pass. This is about, uh, about communism being cool. Japanese being bad and them fighting and things and they have hatchets and I think it's it's like it's like one of those movies where they try to like really build it up but apparently it's like 1949 um, China as the communist revolution is 
going strong. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, you got Ip Man who trained Bruce Lee, blah, 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 uh, Kung Fu. He, he has his own st uh, story about fighting things and fighting tyranny through a sporty turned bloody art in, of Kung Fu. In the end, I'm assuming that one of his friends gets beaten up by a Japanese mercenary person or whatever. And he's like, I didn't want to fight you. He's like, well, I, fight, I fought your friend and I killed him. He's like, well, now I'm going to have to fight you. And that's kind of like how a lot of the Ip Man movies are. So they're kind of remaking it with a different actors and things and stuff. Bring back Donnie Yen. We need him. He's our hero. All right. <laughs> so that it, that's what you got to do for some pre-critic. And um, I have a new dub and stuff for you guys. And it's the only Black Widow movie that's going to be coming out this year. So check it out. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about some city council. Meanwhile, and not in the MCU. boop a doop boop 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 Ding dong. Wait a minute. I don't remember ordering any pizza. <gasps> Wait a minute. It's it's not my birthday, is it? Somebody told me to bring this hat box over here. Well, uh, I don't want to be rude. Uh, why don't you come on in? Let me grab some of your stuff. Make yourself at home. Hold on a second. You're not trying to catfish at me, are you? Because I already paid my dues to the Merchant Marines. Let me take that hat box off your chest. Wow, you really do have a beautiful home. I like how it just kind of opens up and it's like, wow, this is a lot bigger than what you'd see on the street and whatnot. Huh? Mm, my hands are cold. I see you got a lot of stuff that you just keep on putting on your shoulder for me to grab if from God you. If God made women with more arms, they wouldn't need men. Uh, you can leave the uh, gloves on the ottoman. I can uh, pick them up later and possibly use them. Oh yes, I definitely plan on losing uh, quite a few things while I'm here. But not the kind of things that you think I'd lose. After all, you know, I brought a lot of stuff, but not as much stuff as you. I beg your pardon, but I bought all this stuff myself. Well, maybe I do beg your pardon. <laughs> well, that's quite the comeback. Um, I'm going to sip on my tea. With such a big house, you might have... Oh, I beg your pardon? I can't understand you when I'm sipping tea. But I could be losing my hearing, knock on wood. Now that wood sounded exotic. <laughs> well, it is one of a kind. It's, uh, it's made of ducks. Hmm. Hence the, uh... Duck sound. Oh, uh, I think I'm forget. Oh, that's right. I forgot to have breakfast. Well, if you have a kitchen hidden away in here, I can make you eggs. No, that sounds like a terrible idea. And that was the day I decided to open my own restaurant. Here, here's a couple customers that are just coming in right now. I'm gonna go talk to them. Hi, dears. Well, come on in. We're gonna get you a table, and you'll be well, quit nice. doing your job exactly like you're supposed to. How you guys doing? You look like a fine young couple. Oh yes, we're a fine young couple on the outside. <laughs> oh yes, I remember being young and in a couple, but now, hmm, things change. As you can see here, there's been a lot of uh, caricatures on the walls. Uh, hey, uh, darling, why don't you just uh, take care of them? I'm, I'm just going to be over and here. As you can to... see, that was the owner. She's pretty great. Yeah, I'm over here at the bar. Have I ever told you all my bar stories? Look at me, I'm in my pink. I'm talking over here. Now let's get back to that story. Do you know what I absolutely hate? I hate it when people just grab a book right on from a under me. A tale of three uh, villages. Again with this? It was the best western of times. It was the uh, decibels and hertz of times. Back in the day, it was like this and that, and I was just a boy, just minding his own business when, oh man, old Sally Sue was all like, hey, what's going on? I just want to have a good time. Hmm. <laughs> well, so uh, what'll it be? Well, I could really use a good cappuccino. Oh, huh. couldn't we all? Oh, wow. That story over there is getting really boring. I better come in and uh, freshen them things up. Don't mind my swagger. I'm going to be right around here. Uh, hey, uh, could you get out of here? I'm just going to be uh, doing my thing here. I can help these guys. All right, bye. <laughs> Sorry about that confusion over there. I'll be glad to help you. I'll even be at your table, ruining your date, being a third wheel. Everybody knows that a third wheel is a lot more stable than two wheels. I don't mind another person poking and prodding our relationship. Suppose this is the closest thing we'll get to a Black Widow movie, huh? <laughs> Hey guys.
guys, welcome back. This is the city council from December 7th, which happened earlier this week on Monday. And I'm going to kind of go over it. So every every week, uh, sometimes they have a neighborhood report. And in this neighborhood report, they had a slideshow. Uh, this is Jeff Miller from the Rose Park and Lewis and Clark Neighborhoods Leadership Team. And he's talking a little bit more about uh, South Avenue. So let's check it out. South Avenue has a variety of, of uh, cars going along it every day. At the western end, there's a bit over 3,000 per day for a five-year average and a bit over 5,000 per day on the eastern end. That's a five-year average. Most traffic reports are done on a yearly, but uh, the five-year average takes uh, into account some of the variation. Our traffic has been going up slowly over the time period. The speed limit on South Avenue is 30 miles an hour. On Bancroft, the northern portion north of South Avenue has about 3,600 cars per day for a five-year average, and south it has about 6,200 cars per day. The speed limit on Bancroft is 25. The little dog leg that goes from South Avenue over to West Sussex and then joins with Brook Street has a bit over 5,000 cars per day. And the speed limit on that entire area from South Avenue all the way to Brook Street is 25 miles an hour. These are posted and uh, they're very clear to anyone driving through the area. There are, have been since about 2000, seven through about 2017, 51 accidents in the area of the red box on South Avenue. That's about five per year. To the south of South Avenue along Central High School area, there have been 41 accidents in the same time period. That's about four per year. So this area, um, you know, near Seno High School and also the crossroad that goes in front of uh, um, Washington Middle School. Uh, there's a disparity when it comes to uh, traffic, like you heard from him, like one's 25 miles, one's 35 miles per hour. Uh, there are certain things that the uh, city can do and mitigate with the Missoula Department of Tran Montana Department of Transportation, which mostly does highways, but there is the uh, uh, more of the streets that are not part of the highway. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of weird kind of this when it comes to major intersections and non-major intersections. And uh, so far the city sounded like they're uh, pretty good about moving forward and helping this particular area remain 25 miles per hour in front of Santa High School. These changes won't have much of an impact of through traffic. Um, he said that you might lose about a minute off driving through this area, but overall will help pedestrians and students with crossing after school, before school, the city will work with Public Works and Long Range Transportation Plan is currently in the works for that unique intersection with the flashing red light. Mullen Road is on the docket today once again, um, and here's a little bit more background is that Mullen Road and the Mullen area, they had about more than 50 acres that the uh, city of Missoula um, is looking to annex and work with the county of Missoula and creating you know, kind of like a whole new neighborhood. And they're working with Dover, uh, Cole and Partners. Um, so, for, so far, here is developmental services uh, person, um, uh, Tom Zabitz. He talks about the build grant that would improve the streets and work with development in creating affordable housing in the city of Missoula without losing the aesthetic of the neighborhood feel. And this is what he had to say. Getting, we, we've had so many parties involved with contributing to this plan and there were so many agencies and issues to balance that it made it difficult. I think it was difficult for everybody. And we needed to do this in a, a little bit faster than normal time frame and do it during this health emergency. And I just really am grateful for all of the agencies and other partners that contributed to this. It, it was not easy. And I know that most everybody probably feels like they didn't get everything they wanted, but what I can say is that most, if not all of them, would agree that, that this is the best solution. 
The city wanted uh, the Mullen area to be a little more high density, but with neighborhood outreach and stuff that a lot of the developer Dover Coal and partners were working with, they heard a lot of feedback from the neighborhoods and they said that they wanted more of that mixed use kind of deal. So they wanted to have the neighborhoods kind of stay the neighborhoods and then kind of slowly move into those more high density places. Uh, the city of Missoula is not going to have this kind of high density that they would have wanted from it, but it's going to be more reflective of what the neighbors want and somewhat what the city wants and the city needs in terms of uh, creating affordable housing in the city of Missoula. Um, so these traditional neighborhoods, which have about four to six acres, for four to six homes on an acre um, as they move into more deeper density as well. Jason King, he's a rep from the developer, Dover Coal and Partners. He talks a little bit more about this. Uh, the county and the city have said firmly, this is to be an area that mixes uses. It's to have a residential density of 15 units to the acre, which can support transit. And uh, all roads should be complete streets as much co as comfortable for bicyclists and pedestrians as for uh, automobiles. And so you created a map with large colors and said, do this. And uh, we worked with the community to specify what that meant. And you'll see there's mixed use, which is the purple, quite a bit of green, and then a, a neighborhood residential area that we've worked to define. And it, it does, it seems quite counterintuitive to take an area that's currently being grazed and say, build here and build densely, you know. Um, but your area does not have an inexhaustible uh, market for units. I know it feels that way, but the reality is you are one of those places that can satisfy, you know, many years worth, or at least multiple years worth of, of population pressure by picking an area. You're building here at the edges of the city uh, so that way you don't lose land elsewhere, land that it, everyone feels is preserved. It must be preserved, but it isn't. And um, that's the idea. Build here so that way the ridge lines and, uh, and the green hills are not places where you see development. I think it's also really important to understand that um, Missoula is a high demand, uh, movable place. A lot of people want to move to the city of Missoula. And as a, as a result, there's not many homes that are available. And the homes that are available are starting to skyrocket in terms of pricing. Last week, I did a video about some of the residents and also former residents who had to leave Missoula because they could not afford to live here. And that's one of the things that uh, the city wanted to kind of help curve. Uh, but a lot of times, you got to under you do have to understand that sometimes when you're trying to build so many homes so quickly, you uh, lose the I idea that uh, you know too fast, too quickly. You know, high density gentrification, and at, in the end, it's it kind of like you're creating a whole bunch of empty buildings. In the end, a lot of times, depending upon how many people move to Missoula and how many people actually stay in Missoula. That's one of the things that I've always noticed about uh, Missoula in terms of that is that, uh, you know, the University of Montana of, uh, doesn't, I um, mean, they, they, they don't have a necessarily an issue with new students coming to the college, but as, as much as uh, retaining the current um, schools as well. So that's what I kind of see about Missoula is in terms of that theme is that I see a lot of people moving to Missoula, but I don't see too many people actually staying in Missoula. And that's, uh, as I said in my report before, is that uh, the DRR, the displacement rate ratio, is so high in the state of in Missoula compared to other cities in the nation, Miami and Spokane, for example, is that there's a higher chance, a seven percent chance that people will be displaced from their homes. It usually has to do with the fact of high uh, living costs and uh, low uh, wages for their jobs. And there's not many jobs in the city of Missoula that are actually uh, fruitful in the long term. But let's not get too much into that. Jason King. Uh, talks about the plan for this particular area up in the Mullen acreage. You'll notice the hand-drawn plan that we did while we were talking to the public. There's the 6,000 units that Tom mentioned, but it's done in a walkable mixed-use format with connected streets, five potentially um, complete centers, six miles of new trails. Uh, this plan allows for and encourages the restoration of Grant Creek, Although, as Tom said, that's really its own endeavor, but we did everything to make that, um, to help that. Uh, and then uh, and we picked a spot and we worked with owners 
to designate a large urban farm to be the centerpiece of this community. There'll be less, you know, wide open fields, but we can optimize the area that remains. And 40 acres is a lot. One of the things that uh, the planning board were talking about in length, uh, this is another meeting that happened months and months ago, but they were uh, bringing this up, is egg land. So there, there's a lot of land here that was former farmland that was used, and then a lot of the owners of this land started to sell their property off for these developments of neighborhoods and whatnot, off Flynn Lane, Mullen Road areas, and as a result... <laughs> um, um, there is that potential for like, oh, w w we want to eventually use this for egg land. We're, we're running out of a lot of land that is prime for egg land, you know, the bitterroot um, and all sorts of uh, things that you can grow there as well. They did go into more detail about this area for management to commercial spaces, but I wanted to dive into more of Missoula's reaction of this new development. Uh, John DeArmond, uh, Clark, Clark Fork Coalition Science Coordinator, had this to say about this land. In terms of the plan itself and the code that accompanies it, um, as a watershed group, our interests are mostly focused on Grant Creek. We really like what we see in the plan and what's been presented. Um, the 200 foot setbacks, the progressive stormwater management that Jason talked about tonight, and the overall vision of a restored Grant Creek are really what we had hoped to see come out of this process. And, um, we hope you'll considering or you'll consider adopting the plan and the code that supports it. We think that as Missoula continues to grow, this plan and the code could provide a blueprint for development that provides much needed housing and neighborhoods while also preserving and restoring the natural areas that are attracting so many people to the area in the, area in the first place. Our biggest remaining concern uh, is related to the implementation of the plan and specifically how the community can generate the support and secure the funding necessary to actually restore Grant Creek, um, both in the Mall and Master, Master Plan area and beyond. Um, given the speed with which the Mullen area is likely to be developed, um, the window of opportunity is probably going to be pretty brief and we're unlikely to get another chance at it. Um, but we're optimistic that Missoulians can come together and support Grant Creek and the restoration of the channel. And we're looking forward to working with all of you and the community to make the vision presented in the plan a reality on the ground. So the Grand Creek Restoration Project, they're still looking for Missoulian support uh, just to kind of help restore the land, restore natural areas, have more natural parks. You know, the city of Missoula just recently bought a whole area of acreage as well as we move on to our next topic. But this is kind of like uh, this is kind of like an updated deal as they're ongoing with development and also creating sidewalk streets and stuff in, in conjunction with the build grant. And part of the build grant, it was like a federal grant, uh, better utilizing uh, infrastructure land development. And part of this is to uh, kind of help leverage for more affordable housing, which as a result would be more density, which a lot of the neighbors are kind of concerned about, which uh, the developers is like, okay, we're going to develop this whole area, but we're going to make sure that we have uh, open space land that's uh, that's prominent, that has the ability, of an urban garden, as you heard, uh, or, or urban farm. Uh, sorry, urban garden is different, but, um, but that's part of what they wanted to do, but also uh, try to maximize space for everybody to uh, have, you know, the right amount of access and the reason why people want to move here in the first place. So Emily Armstrong with Community Planning and Innovation talks about um, another thing that's happening in the city of Missoula and that has to do with a uh, winter emergency shelter for the homeless here in Missoula. So just a quick breakdown of the budget. Like I said, we're planning to, or proposing to spend the entirety of those round three COVID funds on the emergency winter shelter, which is that 365 to 27 number. Um, we're also given the, the needs of the shelter and uh, the extent of the services being offered. We're proposing to also spend a bit of our entitlement funds, $85,670 um, on the emergency winter as well. We have, we had some funds um, left over from last year and from some program income and so so um, we're hoping to put some of those towards this um, big community need at the same time. Um, all of these funds are one time only just for this season and in response to COVID-19. Um, we have created a substantial amendment to include um, this emergency winter shelter proposal into our program year 2020 annual action plan, which was originally presented to this council in June. 
Um, and so the substantial amendment was uh, provided, I believe, to you all in advance, and it just includes this emergency winter shelter language and um, includes it as a funding, uh, a subrecipient in our funding sources. And uh, the city also already dedicated $50,000 of general funds, which were contracted separately and are not impacted or do not impact this funding source. Um, and it will not impact the city budget at all. From what I've been told from uh, United Way and uh, did a story just recently, a couple, uh, 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 just before Thanksgiving, uh, about moving uh, Reserve Street over to uh, um, off Highway 93 in a private area where they're putting up pitching up a bunch of tents up there. Uh, one of the things that they've noticed is that the, uh, the Paul Varela Centers had to uh, work at a certain level of capacity to uh, in reaction of COVID. And so they had some more spill out areas. You know, um, you have the emergency winter shelter that is uh, off of uh, Johnson and uh, North Street, which is 1919 North Street. And part of this um, is that they wanted to continue funding this site as well, which they did. And from this, they said that they're going to be able to uh, continue funding this area as well for uh, until the end of March, March 31st. Um, the city has, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's the old Sheck building off of uh, North and um, Johnson Street. All right, the city bought Deanstone Corridor to purchase 350 acres for $462,500. This is part of the open space bond. So it was passed back in 2005, and after many, many years, the city bought open space land. It's kind of like how uh, federal government buys public lands, and part of uh, city county is they want to purchase some of these lands to keep them natural and try to maybe create a couple trails here and there, but they bought a huge uh, 350 acres of land through the open space bond, and back in 2018, they asked the citizens of Missoula if they wanted to continue using the open space bond, which the uh, city, the citizens of Missoula decided to be like, yes, we wanted to keep on doing open space bond money, so we're gonna keep paying into that. So it was voted by the majority of Missoula voters. Um, this is a little bit of background, so, um, also, the city looks to continue hiring uh, lobbyist John McDonald to represent the city of Missoula in the upcoming Montana, late, uh, Montana state legislature. The total cost of him is $32,000. A couple of the city council members were not too happy, particularly uh, uh, about hiring a lobbyist. Lobbyists do have uh, a very interesting reputation when it comes to word of mouth, how they're per uh, perceived in the media, how they're portrayed in the movies, and stuff like that. But this lobbyist particularly is the one that goes to Congress and stays in the Montana State Legislature and makes sure that uh, Missoula's um, values are being represented in, in the uh, upcoming Montana late, uh, State Legislature, which happens biannually. So this is a uh, $32,000. They're going to put, put it into this as well. A couple of the city council members were not liking this, but a majority of the city council approved of this. So there's just some of the overview of what's happening within the city of Missoula. I didn't want to get too deep into it because this was an over a three and a half hour a meeting so they'll talk more they talk more detail about the Mullen area if you're interested in that uh, more of the reactions of some of the people of this area and uh, just a lot of stuff that's happening as well uh, so I just wanted to say thank you um, once again for joining me and if you want more information you can go to uh, ci.missoula.mt.us it is a wonderful website where you can find out upcoming meetings, current meetings, and past meetings, agendas, items, and minutes. And it's a great way to kind of uh, learn about how the city works and how the city is moving forward with a lot of their plans and stuff. So that about does it for that. Up next, we, uh, we're going to have a uh, Missoula City County Health Department update. So, uh, And then when I come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more and I'll wrap up my show. Thanks, guys. Hi, my name is Cindy Farr and I'm the Incident Commander for the Missoula City County Health Department's COVID-19 response. Today is Monday, December 7th, and this is my COVID briefing. First, I just want to apologize. I know it's been a while since I've been able to post a briefing. We've had a pretty bad stomach bug circulating through our household. So this is a good time to remind everyone that as we're moving into the winter months, we are definitely beginning to see other viruses circulating in addition to COVID-19. Okay, so here are the numbers. We've now had 5,214 cumulative positive cases of COVID-19 in Missoula County to date, with 236 new cases since Friday. 
We've had 45 deaths associated with COVID-19 to date. We're still awaiting hospitalization data at this time, so I don't have that to share with you today. And we now have 751 active COVID-19 cases, which is continuing to trend down a little bit at this time. Remember that all of these numbers, as well as the graphs and figures associated, are on our website at MissoulaInfo.com. The state of Montana is reporting 68,591 cumulative COVID-19 cases, which is up 720 new cases since yesterday. There are now 17,197 active cases in the state of Montana with 492 active hospitalizations across the state. There have been 742 deaths related to COVID-19 statewide. Currently, the average new cases per 100,000 people is 63, and we are, again, currently seeing a little bit of a decline in that number as well. Just a reminder that we're shooting for getting that number down to 25 per 100,000 people. The state of Montana is reporting an average of 67.78 cases per 100,000 people, so we're pretty close to what we're seeing statewide. Today I have a few things to cover. I'm going to talk about the new guidance on quarantine that came out from the CDC last week, um, vaccine for COVID-19 and what we know and what we don't know at this time, and some changes that have been made to our contact tracing efforts at the health department and what you can do to help make the process go a little bit faster. So first let's talk about the quarantine guidance. Last week, the CDC issued some new guidance about the necessary length of quarantine. Up until now, if you were exposed to COVID-19, it was necessary for you to quarantine for the full 14 days after the last known exposure and monitor yourself for symptoms. While the 14-day quarantine is still recommended for some people, the CDC has issued some new guidance to help reduce the length of quarantine time for most people. Now, quarantine can end after 10 days without testing as long as you remain asymptomatic. You should still monitor yourself for symptoms for the full 14 days and continue to report to our monitoring system for the full 14 days, but you can resume normal activity without the need for continued isolation after day 10, as long as you continue to remain asymptomatic. We're immediately implementing this with our team. If you've passed the 10 day quarantine period, but you've not yet been released at 14 days, our team is working as quickly as possible to contact you and get you released from quarantine. This is gonna take a couple of days as that means that they have to contact hundreds of people. So please just be patient with us. If you were recently exposed, you will automatically be moved into that 10 day quarantine period. The other option for an earlier release from quarantine is that quarantine can end after seven days if you receive a negative test after day five and remain asymptomatic. And again, you still want to monitor yourself for symptoms for the full 14 days. Due to the continued high volume of people experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 here in Missoula County, we do not have the capacity currently to offer asymptomatic testing. Um, in order to facilitate this. That said, we will continue to reassess, and if we see a decline in those having symptoms and we're able to open up asymptomatic close contact testing appointments, we will certainly let you know. Next, I wanna talk about the COVID vaccine that should be starting to trickle into our county over the next few weeks. So here's what we know. Montana will receive 9,750 doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine in the next couple of weeks. They expect it to be getting into Montana by about December 15th. The vaccine requires two doses, 21 days apart, to be effective. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or the ACIP, recommends that the first groups to receive the vaccine be healthcare personnel working on the front lines with patients and residents of, of and let me try that again, and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. While it's encouraged that a vaccine, it's encouraging that a vaccine is going to start trickling in, it could still be several months before it becomes available to the general public. So we're working really closely with our healthcare partners and the state of Montana DPHHS to ensure that we can get the vaccine distributed to those eligible in as timely of a fashion as possible. And we'll continue to keep you posted as we get more information. The last thing I want to talk about are some changes to our contact tracing system. We've now fully transitioned to a system called Sarah Alert for contact tracing. This is an electronic system used by public health across the nation to help speed up contact tracing and monitoring of contacts for symptoms of COVID-19. 
While we had a delay in reaching people while we were transitioning, this process is now moving much faster. If you are identified as a positive case or a contact to a case, you will receive one telephone call from, from our team and then you'll automatically be enrolled in Sarah Alert. So if you receive a text message or a voicemail from our team, please return their call as this can greatly reduce the amount of time it takes for us to get through the contact tracing process. While I know that a lot of the time it becomes much more real when you're the one that's being directly affected by COVID-19, it would really help our team if you could become familiar with the basics of COVID and quarantine and isolation. Um, this information can be found in the FAQ section on our website at missoulainfo.com. If you have this basic knowledge before receiving a call, our team can get through the interview with you much more quickly, allowing them to move on to the next person that they need to call who's in the same situation as you are. So that's it for my briefing for today. Um, as always, you can subscribe on YouTube under my name, Cindy Farr, that's C-I-N-D-Y, F-A-R-R. -R. Click that notification bell so that you get notified when additional videos are uploaded. Um, you can follow us on Facebook at the Missoula City County Health Department's Facebook page and check out our website at missoulainfo.com for all kinds of great information as well as all of the data that I present here to you. Um, you can also call 258-INFO if you would like to schedule a test for COVID-19 or if you have general questions that you would like to ask about COVID-19. So until next time, everybody stay healthy. Hey guys, welcome back. So. You know, like I said before, MCAT uh, continually is uh, working with the library and all their partners under one roof. Um, and we are kind of sitting pretty as everything is starting to get organized and everything is starting to slowly uh, try to have an opening date sometime in January. Um, like I said, I'm not really married to that idea. Blah, blah, blah. But... <laughs> Well, the, but everything is looking good. Um, right now, I'm currently working on a virtual virtual tour of the interior of the building as well. So we'll be able to show you that as soon as it gets final approval by the library board and staff. Um, so, oh, or library board. And uh, yeah, just partners and whatnot, just to kind of give a good representation of what people can expect. And there have been a lot of people who are very curious, you know, they want to go to the library. There has There's a lot of resources within the library as well. So you guys can call ahead. You guys can go to the uh, public library and call them. There's a designated parking spots with the numbers on there, and they bring books out to you. You can go to missoulapubliclibrary.com, uh, .org. For more information as well but as always to find out more about information about mcat we're doing a bunch of live streamings this uh december saturdays um as well leading up until christmas and we're also having a new year's eve uh, uh special uh, in conjunction with the mcps's and arts missoula um first night star kind of deal where it's kind of like the American Idol where all the high schools are going to be singing against each other. So it's going to be a pretty great concert and it's going to be uh, live streamed from MCAT uh, at the Zach. So that's going to be happening on New Year's Eve. So let's, I'll talk a little bit more about it as we go further down into the weeks. But I want to thank you guys for joining me. And as always, uh, for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Take care, guys.